High Mars. Javelins. Howitzers. These weapons can all be found on the battlefield in Ukraine. They're made by American arms companies, and the United States has been providing them to Kyiv since the Russia-Ukraine conflict began in February. Since then, the Biden administration has invested a total of over 8 billion US dollars in security assistance to Ukraine, including weapons. And we are doing everything we can as the United States, working around the clock to deliver our own weapons, organizing and coordinating the delivery of weapons from many other countries. In mid-April, just three days after Sullivan's remarks, the Pentagon hosted leaders from the top eight U.S. weapons manufacturers. They discussed the industry's capacity to meet Ukraine's weapons needs if the conflict continues for years. And in early May, President Joe Biden visited the Lockheed Martin plant, which is helping produce and supply weapons to Ukraine. Lockheed Martin is one of the world's five largest arms companies. The other top four, Raytheon, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and General Dynamics are also all based in the U.S. In 2021, the U.S. was home to half of the world's top 100 producers of arms. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute says the U.S. was the number one weapons exporter by a large margin. From 2017 to 2021, it accounted for 39% of major arms deliveries worldwide. And since the conflict in Ukraine began, these arms producers have been making more money. The stock price of Lockheed Martin rose to $453 per share on March 25th, up from 354 in early January, an increase of 28%. And Raytheon's stock price rose nearly 20% during the same period. The share prices of Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics also increased beginning in late February. Even before the Russia-Ukraine conflict started, CEO of Raytheon Gregory Hayes in January said the company could stand to benefit from tensions in Eastern Europe. From howitzers to tactical vehicles, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is big business for arms makers. President Biden pledged an additional $800 million in weapons. It includes the American-made anti-tank weapon. Washington has sent over 6,500 Javelin anti-tank missile systems to Ukraine, which are made by Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. The cost of each missile is about $78,000, and the launcher is another $100,000. Meanwhile, Raytheon has sent around 1,400 Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to Ukraine already. And the company has been granted a $625 million contract to produce 1,300 more to replenish its stock. The U.S. has also pledged 700 switchblade tactical missile systems made by AeroVironment to Kyiv. Raytheon knows that they can make a profit out of what it calls defending democracy. Uh, I make no apology for that. Uh, I think, again, um, recognizing you know, we are there to defend democracy. Uh, everything that's being shipped into Ukraine today, of course, is coming out of stockpiles, either at DOD or uh, from our NATO allies and uh, that's all great news. Eventually, we'll have to replenish it, and we'll, we will see a, a benefit to the business over the next coming years. While some of the weapons being sent to Ukraine are from some country's existing stockpile, experts say fresher, newly built supplies are also being delivered. As the conflict continues, the United States is granting more aid. In May, Congress approved $40 billion in aid for Ukraine and other countries affected by the conflict. The package includes $19 billion of near-term military aid, accounting for 47% of the total, with $9 billion of that to be used for replenishment of U.S. weapon stocks. The rest of the aid will be used to support U.S. forces in Europe, as well as for global humanitarian relief international programs, and support to NATO allies. Uncertainty remains over how long the conflict will last, but arms makers are still preparing. The head of Northrop Grumman, Kathy Warden, has called on Western governments to clearly outline weapons needs for Ukraine. 
She warned that weapon stockpiles had not been built to service a lengthy conflict. Besides sending weapons to Ukraine, the U.S. State Department in July said it would back the sale of $1.45 billion worth of weapons to NATO allies Estonia and Norway. On July 21st, it also cleared a possible sale of 96 Patriot missiles to the Netherlands. The contract of the Raytheon-made surface-to-air missiles is estimated to be worth $1.2 billion. The two sales have not yet been finalized or approved. As the conflict goes on, military aid from the U.S. and its allies continues to pour into Ukraine. While a prolonged conflict means more suffering for the people in the region, for arms manufacturers and dealers, it means more and bigger business. The Ukraine conflict has brought destruction and human sufferings. For over nearly six months, it has been linked to growing global food and energy crises. On several occasions, the U.S. has invested huge sums in military aid to Kyiv, now totaling over $7.6 billion. With no clear end in sight, why is Washington this invested in a fight across the globe it did not begin? One answer, the military-industrial complex. The military-industrial complex is the one that benefits from this. They clearly control the Biden administration, warmongers on both sides in Washington who have been drum drumming up these tensions. The military-industrial complex starts to make a ton of more money than, than they have been in fighting uh, al-Qaeda or, or making weapons for al-Qaeda. And who pays the price? The American people pay the price. The Ukrainian people pay, pay the price. The Russian people pay the price. It undermines our own national security. But the military-industrial complex that controls so many of our politicians wins, and they, they run to the bank. More than 60 years ago, former U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower coined the term when he warned against unchecked military might as he stepped down from office. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Broadly, the term refers to the often comfortable relationship between government entities responsible for national security and businesses in the defense industry. Politicians get the weapons their fights require and a chance to further their political interests at home or abroad. While the defense companies are insured lucrative business deals often worth billions of dollars, in more blatant terms, it is war for profit. While not an American invention, it has come to define U.S. foreign policy ever since Eisenhower's warning, and stoking geopolitical tensions in the name of peacekeeping is big business. In 2020, then-President Donald Trump ordered the assassination of top Iranian general Qasem Soleimani. In the 24 hours after Soleimani's killing, the share value of the CEOs at the top five Pentagon contractors spiked by roughly $7 million as rumors of conflict spread. These top contractors, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, General Dynamics, and Northrop Grumman have all been on the Fortune 500 list of most valuable companies every single year since the first edition in 1955. In the aftermath of the attack on Soleimani, these five companies collectively earned nearly $36 billion in revenue in 2021 alone. So how exactly does this network operate? U.S. defense companies make most of their money from domestic sales to the country's gargantuan military. But America is also the largest arms exporter in the world. According to a report by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, U.S. weapons exports grew by 14 percent over a four-year period and accounted for 39 percent of all global sales from 2017 to 2021. 
Russia, its closest competitor, doesn't even account for half of that. The report also shows U.S. exports increasing to Europe by nearly 20% in the same period. With the start of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, exports due to rise even more. Companies like Raytheon bid on defense contracts from the Pentagon, with all domestic and foreign sales requiring approval by Congress. Basically, we're out of money. And so that's why today, in order to sustain Ukraine as it, as it continues to fight, I'm sending Congress a supplemental budget request. It's going to keep weapons and ammunition flowing without interruption to the brave Ukrainian fighters. As a result, these firms have adopted a multi-pronged approach to try and get as much support in Congress as possible. Public Citizen reveals the defense giants gave $10.2 million to members of the House and Senate Armed Services Committees prior to their votes this June to increase overall defense spending. Subsequently, the committees voted to increase the Pentagon budget for the coming fiscal year by an additional $37.5 billion in the House and $45 billion in the Senate. The report illustrates that the majority of these campaign contributions went to members who voted to increase the Pentagon budget. What's more, a vote in favor could mean a contribution triple the size of a vote against. For most of the defense industry, their biggest source of business is the Department of Defense. So they kind of live and die with the defense budget as it increases, their revenue increases, as it decreases, their revenue decreases. If buying loyalty fails, they have another weapon in their strategic arsenal. One thing most lawmakers support is job creation in their home states. So many major U.S. firms spread their operations across as many states as possible. Take a look at the F-35 project by Lockheed Martin. According to their website, this warplane represents more than 254,000 jobs across 45 states. As divided as American politicians are these days, conflict is often one topic that receives broad bipartisan support in Congress. Lockheed Martin also uses subcontractors in at least 10 other countries, not to mention the more than a dozen allied countries that have placed orders for the jet for militaries of their own. This one project represents hundreds of thousands of jobs and dollars and is a master class in political engineering. It maximizes the number of politicians and clients that support their projects regardless of political affiliation or merit. Due to a myriad of issues over the past 20 years, the F-35 planes have been called a waste of money, practically failures. But now, with the conflict in Ukraine, they're being billed as essential and precisely designed. This is just one example of how the military-industrial complex dictates U.S. domestic and foreign policy. When political involvement is so evidently reliant on economic clout, it begins to illustrate why America's wars last so long. If the U.S. war machine stops, it would be an economic and political disaster for Washington. Hundreds of thousands of Americans would be without jobs. The military-industrial complex would lodge its own wars on Washington, and the United States international relationships would be put to the ultimate test. United States has only been at peace for 17 years of its 246-year history. It thrives through war, it cashes in on war. During the first two years of the Second World War, Washington remained neutral, merely supplying weapons. America's isolation from war ended in December 1941 when Japan attacked American military installations in the Pacific. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might 
will win through to absolute victory. Then President Roosevelt vastly increased government defense spending. The percentage of U.S. gross national product devoted to defense spending rose from 2% in 1939 to 42% in 1945. During this period of time, the U.S. government placed $175 billion of prime defense contracts with U.S. corporations. Two-thirds of these awards went to only 100 companies and 20% to only 5 companies. After four years of involvement in the Second World War, the United States transformed from a mid-level global power to the world leader. With rapid rise in power and influence, building a global hegemony, the military-industrial complex grew to gigantic proportions during the war and then flourished during the four decades of the Cold War. The United States began to exert efforts building a world-leading weapons industry and extended it to new industries like aerospace, energy, electronics, information technology, and bioengineering. Think tanks and the media have all been dragged into it and they became part of the complex of shared interest. Between 1948 and 1989, the government spent more than $10 trillion for national defense and much of the money found its way into the bank accounts of the defense contractors, their employees, and their suppliers. In 1961, the U.S. went to the war in Vietnam to support a pro-U.S. government and contain communism. Back then, there was an increase in the use of contractors to maintain increasingly complex weapon systems alongside troops in the field, as well as the use of private air transport companies like Air America. Take General Electric, one of the United States' largest military contractors. The company's working aerospace production was mainly for the government and was considered essential for the nation's security. Between 1962 and 1970, the company experienced dramatic growth. Over the course of eight years, sales improved at a relatively steady pace. Sales in 1970 were $3.75 billion higher than sales in 1962. Meanwhile, during the period between 1970 and 1989, the profit rates of the top 50 defense contractors substantially exceeded those of comparable non-defense companies. In 1991, a massive U.S.-led coalition, including NATO allies and Middle East nations, initiated an offensive and started the Gulf War in response to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. As one of the shortest conflicts in U.S. history, it brought catastrophic consequences for Iraq. According to the Project on Defense Alternative Study, between 20,000 and 26,000 Iraqi military personnel were killed in the conflict while 75,000 others were wounded. But for the U.S., it was a success. The war helped restore American military hegemony, consolidate its control of oil, and defend the dominant position of the dollar. The United States was even able to let others pay for the bulk of the cost of war. The U.S. Department of Defense has estimated the cost of the Gulf War at $61 billion with the U.S. providing only 11% of that. Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and other Gulf states covered $36 billion. Germany and Japan covered $16 billion. Plus, the U.S. armed forces displayed a well-integrated approach to the use of precision munitions and long-range strikes. Many saw the battlefield as an arms bazaar that boosted sales of U.S. weapons. Since the end of the Cold War, the U.S. has launched wars in Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, and many others, from which American arms dealers have made a great fortune. According to a study by Brown University, $6.4 trillion has been spent on post-9-11 wars and conflicts in more than 80 countries, and most of the budgets were transferred to the top five contractors. From 2001 to 2021, the stocks of those top five contractors outperformed the stock market overall by 58%. The wars are all about expanding the interests and the power of the U.S. My fellow citizens, at this hour, 
American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. The Iraq war was perceived by many as a move to have total control of the oil resources in the region and secure Washington's dominant role in formulating global energy policies. In October 2000, Saddam Hussein moved to switch Iraq's oil trade from the dollar to the euro. But the U.S. invasion of 2003 set the country's oil industry safely back into dollar denomination. The human toll of America's wars is huge. Since 2001, U.S. military operations have killed more than 900,000 people, about 335,000 of whom were civilians. Millions were injured. Millions more were displaced. Despite the death and despair it has caused, War has been integral to America's prosperity and affluence. War is the business of America. Conflict and military operations are a hegemonic tool for the United States. In an uncertain world full of breathtaking change, the one constant is American leadership. America needs to lead. The world wants America to lead. American leadership still matters. Strengthening American leadership has been the goal and slogan of almost all U.S. politicians. What does American leadership mean? It means working to build up American dominance in all areas. Politics, economics, security, and soft power. To achieve this, the United States believes it must establish its military dominance and that the use of military power can be justified based on the U.S. interpretation of geopolitical events overseas. Now, of course, American military and economic strength will remain the foundation of our global leadership. As we saw from the intervention to stop a massacre in Libya to the raid that brought bin Laden to justice, there will always be times when it is necessary and just to use force. But over seven decades ago, before the start of the Second World War, the idea of the United States as a leading global power was not an ambition of American politicians. It had sought to stay away from conflict. I hope the United States will keep out of this war. I believe that it will. And I give you assurance and reassurance that every effort of your government will be directed toward that end. Thus, the U.S. was the only major power to avoid economic ruin during the Second World War because so little of it was fought on American soil. But the war transformed America's global presence forever, politically, militarily, and economically. Certain countries of key importance During a conference held at Bretton Woods in July 1944, delegates from 44 countries proposed to establish a new international monetary system. Back then, exchange rates were linked to gold reserves. With the United States holding roughly two-thirds of the available gold reserve, the U.S. dollar emerged as the currency standard for international commerce and trade. This became another basis of U.S. hegemony. With the defeat in 1945 of Hitler's army, the wartime alliance between the capitalist United States and the socialist Soviet Union began to come apart. As the two nations vied for spheres of influence in what became known as the Cold War. Since then, the desire to protect this newfound power and to secure the United States as the leader of the free world has been a fixture of U.S. foreign policy. To achieve this end, the United States started to increase its military budget. A large proportion of this budget flows into the arms industry, propelling the U.S. as the world's number one weapons exporter from 2017 to 2021. The United States accounted for 39% of major arms deliveries worldwide. As another way to shore up its global dominance, the United States has set up about 750 military bases around the world. They are everything from massive military compounds to small airstrips in the middle of the ocean. The United States also builds a network of allies to project its power. On April 4th, 
1949, the United States joined 11 nations in the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, was initially created to deter attacks from the Soviet Union. But as the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, the military alliance remained intact and even expanded after the Cold War ended. Since 1949, NATO has grown from 12 members to 30 today, two in North America and 28 in Europe, taking into its fold the nations that were once a part of the Soviet Union. As the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact disintegrated, was there a real need for NATO's continued existence, let alone its continuous expansion? I don't see the need to uh, expand NATO, particularly in the period in which uh, the Cold War, which had been the primary rationale for NATO, uh, was over. Since 1952, NATO enlargement has fueled tensions between the United States and its allies on one side, and Russia, the biggest of the former Soviet Union republics, on the other. As news spread in late 2021 of thousands of Russian troops amassing on its border with Ukraine, in early February 2022, U.S. President Joe Biden ordered around 3,000 U.S. troops to deploy to Poland and Romania, two NATO countries that border Ukraine. Later that month, on February 24th, Russian President Volodymyr Putin announced the beginning of a special military operation in Ukraine, claiming that NATO's encroachment and its influence on Ukraine threatened Russia's existence. Блок НАТО начал активное военное освоение прилегающих к нам территорий. Таким образом, планомерно создавалась абсолютно неприемлемая для нас угроза, причем непосредственно у наших границ. Россия дала упреждающий отпор агрессии. Это было вынужденное, своевременное и единственно правильное решение. Решение суверенной, сильной, самостоятельной страны. In addition to direct military aid to Ukraine from the United States and its allies, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has pushed NATO countries to increase their military spending. Germany plans to ramp up its defense spending to over 2% of GDP in 2022 alone by $112 billion. French President Emmanuel Macron has also pledged to increase defense spending to 50 billion euros in 2025. Belgium's parliament has approved a bill that will increase its defense budget by more than 10 billion euros by 2030. Poland, which borders Ukraine, now plans to raise military spending from 2% to 3% of its GDP in 2023. The Russia-Ukraine conflict is giving European nations the rationale to justify bigger defense budgets and purchases of more weapons. The rising budgets have undoubtedly created another huge windfall for American arms manufacturers. The conflict heightens possibilities of a greater U.S. military presence in Europe, particularly near the Russian border, aggravating already tense relations between Russia and the U.S.-led West. But the United States seems determined to follow the path of military dominance. A Gallup poll conducted in February 2022 shows that only 7% perceive the U.S. as having a very favorable standing in the eyes of the world. But that 68% believe it's important for America to remain number one in the world militarily. The myth Americans tell themselves is that a strong United States is key to world peace and global prosperity. But if the U.S. war machine does not stop and the country is always ready to use force to advance its hegemonic interests, how will the world achieve peace?